Thank you so much, Amber. Thank you so much, Chad, and the rest of the Stu Kent team. This has been a really amazing PropCon. So thank you for being a resource to those of us who teach throughout the year, but especially over the past week. What an awesome event. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we will dive right in. All right, everybody can see my screen. Looks fine, right? Nothing wrong with it. So a heads up, the entire session will be presented backwards and in reverse. So strap yourselves in. We're talking about backward course design. It's really the only way to do it. Right, just kidding. We are going to uh, go ahead and get started here, but we are going to talk about changing our thinking. So you don't necessarily have to do this, but you do want to revisit how you approach designing, planning your courses. It's really what the value of backward course design offers. I'm a digital marketing strategist, so I'm always thinking about optimization, and I'm always trying to keep all tactics, everything that my team and I do, laser focused on meeting the business objectives that our clients have for us. When you employ backward course design, you're doing the same thing. You're just laser focused on those course learning outcomes. So why don't we start there? At the end of the session, here are my goals for each of you who are watching. It's really important to know that backward course design doesn't involve a lot of research, doesn't involve a lot of extensive training, but there are a couple of elements that are good to know about if you want to take advantage of this particular approach when you design or plan a new course. One of the best values that I think backward course design offers a faculty member is the opportunity to take a different look at a course to see the work that you do through a different lens and a very specific lens where you're choosing assignments, projects, and assessments based on their value to the student at the end of the course, but also create a good experience for you. Are we creating projects that are too difficult to grade that don't necessarily contribute to the advancement of learning for our students? That's not a good match. So it's really helpful technique to employ overall. What I'd like you to do in the chat right now is just tell me what's on deck for you this summer. So type the word new if you are writing a new course. Type the word revise if you are revising a course that you've taught before. Or if you are hanging out by the beach, let us know that. Or you could just type update if you're just going to give a little judge to courses you've taught before. All right, so Kim and Joe are revising. Zach, a revise and an update. You go, Tim. New, revise, and by the beach. See, we can have it all, folks. Faculty can have it all. all right, Tammy is updating, revising. Update, revise. Awesome. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you are engaging in some activities. Backward course design could really be of value to you. So we're going to be best friends uh, over the next 45 minutes. Hopefully, these tools are things that you'll be able to employ while you are doing your course revisions and your updates. Now, ultimately, we're looking at the production of a document that I call a course map. Others call it a module map or a lesson map. But a course map is really a, an important and key artifact in backward course design. At the end of the session, I will give you a link. I have a template for you, as well as some other resources to make it easy for you to bring backward course design to some of the work that you're doing this summer, uh, especially if you're doing it from the beach, like Tim. All right, so let's start off earliest stage. What are we really talking about here? What is backward course design or BCD? Now, I know we are all in countdown mode, even though it's June. And for us, fall classes at our institution do not begin until the end of August but we, we just have that countdown going, right, until the first day of class. And, and for us, we go in a week before the first day of classes for different meetings. Maybe some of you have a, a similar schedule. But usually when we think about course planning, we're thinking about how are we going to set up day one. And backward course design just asks us to do something different where we think about the end of the course, the last day of the course, specifically what we want a student to be able to do. So we're going to look at the end of the course first, and work our way backwards. Really the key question that is in play here is what should students be able to do at the end of your course that they weren't able to do before having your class? It's important for a couple of different reasons, but that's where we wanna start. What are the, the tasks? What are the skills? 
what are the knowledge areas that, that students will be able to demonstrate competency around after working with you for the term. Now, why do we do backward course design? There's several reasons why this technique is, is helpful to us. I'm gonna run you through a couple that have resonated with me and how I actually got started in backward course design. Like many of you who teach digital marketing, analytics, different marketing communications classes, you may do flipped classroom activities, I do, and backward course design is really helpful in setting those up. But I had never fully developed a course from finish to start using backward course design for the entire development of my plan until the pandemic. So it was spring of 2020, middle of the semester, we went completely remote and I had to come up with some alternative projects and assessments for students in the class. Later that year in the summer, I realized I really liked some of the activities that I came up with to pivot better than my original plan. So I started trying to Frankenstein the class, taking some pre-pivot, mid-pivot, and post-pivot assignments, trying to construct a class from all of those different elements. And, and it was just too much of a square peg round hole situation. So I started over from scratch and made sure that I was choosing assessments and learning activities based on the value that they offered students and, and to me as well. Sometimes you change delivery method, and, and this is happening at campuses across the country and has for a while now. We made the decision at the Carmel Boyer School of Business here at Baldwin Wallace to offer all of our graduate programs in the high flex model. So every class is offered three ways, seated in person, real time Zoom or synchronous, and asynchronous students can watch recordings later. And the student can change their delivery method from week to week. If they're having a busy day at work and can't make it to the evening class, they'll jump on Zoom or they'll be asynchronous that week. They really get to have it their way. But that changed a lot of what the class had to look like for me and the students. I had to be very intentional, intentional about creating learning activities and outcomes that spoke to students regardless of their delivery method. So if you're changing how you offer the class, BCD is very valuable. We also had the opportunity to take my full 16 week introductory digital marketing course and offer an eight week summer version. Now, again, we're not often forced to look at our courses and, and look at what we're teaching at such a critical, from such a critical perspective. Um, when I had to take a 16 week class and get it down to eight weeks, I could have just made every week in the summer count for two. But when I looked at the course, I actually saw that some early modules in the full semester version were very foundational, low level order thinking skills, low level Bloom's taxonomy that actually grouped the first three weeks into one week. And some of the more challenging and important significant course concepts got their own week. So backward course design helped me get there just gives you some guidance when you need to look at your courses in a new way. I think what happens more than anything when we start to look at our courses, and, and that's beyond feedback that we get from student evals. It might be beyond incorporating program or curricular changes and best practices. And you know, as well as I do, if you teach digital marketing, what you teach in the fall about SEO will change by January. So we're always on our toes. But what I usually see are some activities or projects that really seem to work and are the right projects for that student at that point in their academic career and in, in the class. But there might be something that doesn't work, but I don't know it doesn't work. I'm not getting feedback from students on it. Seems like I've offered this activity in the past, but when I look at it from a different perspective, I could be doing something a little bit more effective. And this is usually what I see among several types of classes, but particularly among digital marketing, analytics, and a lot of the promotional communication related areas. We fall into a danger zone where we might offer something called a donut course. And a donut course is just a, a term that I coined to describe a class that has a lot to offer students, but it could be so much better if it was done slightly different. So let's take a look at a donut, right? So um, we're not too far from lunchtime here on the East Coast, so I'm getting hungry. Uh, but 
let's look at this donut and consider what it is. We have this circle of really yummy, really tasting stuff. Um, but there's something missing in a donut. That's what makes it a donut, right? There's no center. So when we think about a really cool digital marketing course, we see the opportunity to offer cool tech in the classroom, maybe some heavy duty technology that students are using, simulations that they're using, students who have uh, you know, to turn their homework in via Instagram. So they get excited about it. It's a different experience for them. And a lot of us embrace the flipped classroom methodology. Courses in our space tend to be very dynamic. We focus on active learning. Maybe we have a classroom client. Maybe we have a couple of businesses that the class is working with. So we offer really unique academic experiences and we embed certifications from Stu Kent, from other providers into the course experience as well. So we look at the, these awesome things and we're offering them to students. They get excited about it. We love teaching it, but there's one thing that's missing. They're not necessarily centered around course learning outcomes. Here's another way to, to express this. I think we have our course learning outcomes. Your department gives them to you. Maybe you've inherited a course um, someone else used to teach. Maybe at your institution, every section of a specific course uh, uses the same learning outcomes. What tends to happen is we have our outcomes over here, but then we have our activities, our assessments, and how we prepare students over here. And backward course design just makes sure that everything is nicely woven together, that everything's purposeful and really has a unique purpose to offer a great experience to students. Now, if you could just put a QM in the chat if your institution uses Quality Matters. So just type QM in the chat. Okay. All right. All right. So if you're not familiar, Quality Matters. Oh, more coming in, um, produces a, a pretty standard rubric that many institutions use to roll out courses. And it's a great quality assurance document. Our institution uses it at the undergrad level. For our graduate program, we rolled out our own rubric. Oh, shout out to you, James. QM rubric certified here too. It's great. And I do recommend um, pursuing that professional development opportunity to become certified in QM. QM refers to something it calls alignment. And as you plan a course, alignment generally refers to making sure that different elements of your course speak back to stated course learning outcomes. So if your institution subscribes to QM, if you're revising courses to fit QM, backward course design will help you get there pretty quickly and efficiently. So you want to think about that. And if you're using another rubric or another model, it can, it can help you with uh, aligning your courses the right way too. Um, you're a creditor, not, not that we get out of bed every day thinking about what our creditors uh, want from us. We get out of bed thinking every day, what can we do to help students learn and grow? But if you employ backward course design, you're creating courses intentionally around those learning outcomes. And that could really benefit you or whoever your main, your, your colleague is who's the main um, accreditation rep um, in doing any kinds of reporting that you need to provide to that official. So backward course design can help in that administrative sense of operating your courses too. What's really great about BCD is that when you do it for several classes that are part of a larger program, or you do it for your undergraduate courses and your graduate courses, you could avoid some sort of duplication. For example, if we want students in the upper level digital marketing class, their capstone in DM, to be able to do certain things by the time it's done, how does that impact the course design for the initial DM class at the graduate level? So do we pick up where we leave off? And do we make sure that if a certification is required at an undergrad class, that the same certification isn't required There's it at the graduate level? So we can avoid some redundancies. So very useful for those of you that have individual courses that are part of larger programs. Now, this is, I took this photo. This is what your assessment team will feel if you start employing backward course design. Again, we don't get out of bed every day wondering what the assessment folks think about the work that we do, but when you're intentionally creating course content around outcomes, it does make it easier to assess your program because you've gone into 
that experience working with your students, thinking about the outcome and thinking about assessment in general. Where I think BCD offers the most value is when you work with employers. Because I'm focused on course learning outcomes in the classes, when I talk to employers who'd like to hire our students for internships or for entry level jobs, I can understand pretty quickly when I look at their job description, okay, we're recruiting students that have had this class or these two classes. When I create a talent pipeline with an employer, I can go to that employer and say, here's everything students will be able to do by the time they start working with you. Do you have input? Should we change our program? It, it's really great to be able to have that evidence when you start working with employers. And that gets your program closer to what I call the resume mic drop. That when a student applies for a position at, uh, at an employer and they see that they're from your institution, the search is over because you, you just start to build a, a positive reputation for your program being focused on what students will be able to do. That's your pitch to employers. You have the evidence to back it up. It's a win for everybody. All right, so in terms of getting started and employing these techniques to the work that you're going to do over the summer, we are going to focus on the ultimate outcome and that's the production of the course map which will guide your backward course design process. So when you start to employ BCD on your own courses, that's where you're going to start too, just like I did on that previous slide. The two main ingredients you need to make this happen are your CLOs, your course learning outcomes. For the most part, those may already be prescribed to you. And what's great if you are an adjunct or you're teaching at an institution where the same CLOs exist for every section of intro to marketing, which is probably the case, BCD lets you make the course your own while still guaranteeing you're meeting course outcomes. We could have a whole other session on developing outcomes. We'll spend a little time on it, but we're gonna assume that you already have a nice set of learning outcomes. And then we need to modularize your course. So a couple different ways that, that we can do that. How do we split up? your 16 weeks or your 12 weeks, your eight weeks into portions. So that way we can understand how we chip away at these overall course learning outcomes bit by bit, okay? All right, so let's start with those course learning outcomes and how we develop them. If you think about your course over the 16 week, 14 week period, whatever schedule your institution uses, Typically, you need to introduce some concepts, then you need to apply them, then let's reinforce them, and then give students the opportunity to showcase some mastery of those concepts. So maybe it's a slow build over the course of the semester from that foundational work to that higher order work. In other words, you, your course is probably already set up unintentionally following Bloom's taxonomy. Where we're going from lower order skills like recalling information to being able to do something with it. I linked to this book in the handout, about 20 years old at this point, but there have been some updates that's exceptionally helpful in assessing the work that you do as an instructor by looking at your course learning outcomes and, and seeing where there are opportunities to change some of the work that you do. So if we're looking at that 16 week semester, we need to start out with those knowledge, lower order thinking skills where we're introducing concepts to students and then we get to creation, production, evaluation, those higher order thinking skills at the end. So I actually like to think of the course learning outcome first that's on the higher order or the top of Bloom's taxonomy, wanna start there. So maybe in a digital marketing analytics class, I wanna tell employers that Students who've had this course, they can hit the ground running with your digital marketing analytics team, produce a report that your team could act upon, that they are experienced enough to be able to do that. But in order to get to that point, we know there's going to be some initial work and instruction that has to be done. So in order to produce that marketing analytics report, they need to be able to describe what marketing analytics actually is and talk about it at a professional level. And then maybe I fill out the space in between with some additional outcomes, All right? So we have our set of course learning outcomes. 
some literature will say three to four, some will say five to seven. I think it's important for those of you who offer courses as part of a program to create program learning outcomes first and then outcomes for each of your courses. And if you're on a campus where the School of Business offers some social media marketing courses, but the communications program in another school on campus also has social media courses, it is important to like, think outside your school and see who's learning what, where, and that will impact your course design as well. So we have our CLOs, and now we're going to work into modularizing or chunking, technical term, right? Uh, chunking our courses up into digestible pieces. Now, we're gonna look at that start of the semester to the very end of the semester. Whenever I do uh, a backward course design, I do need to understand what students are experiencing and other things on the calendar. So we're probably gonna need to do some onboarding onto the course, get them hooked up on StuKent, have them join my HubSpot Academy team, get them using maybe a specific Google account just for projects in this class. Finals week, have a different schedule. Also have to think about spring break. I don't like introducing a big project or new content right before spring break. So keep in mind as you create these chunks, just to think about some of those external uh, events, as well as just the facilitation of the course. A really common approach to segmenting your instruction into modules is the module by chapter technique. And you see this quite a bit, particularly helpful in introductory courses, but it could also really benefit you in an upper level course as well. Sometimes it works out nicely where each module focuses on one chapter, but your course schedule may have more weeks than your book has chapters or it could be the opposite. So you might have some weeks that you're so focused on a big project, there isn't reading to be done that week, but it's not a bad place to, to start. If you haven't thought of your course in modular, module format before, good, good place to start, revolve it around your text. Similarly, you could also segment your course into modules by topic or topical areas. Um, some of the modules then might need to be longer or shorter than others, depending upon that topic. For consistency, I like to keep each module in my class to be the same amount of time, so one week. So if I have a major content area that would span three weeks, like initial understanding of SEO, organic, owned media analytics, something lofty and large, paid, paid social, paid analytics, I will do a part one, part two, part three. So SEO, intro to SEO, intermediate SEO, advanced SEO. So even though I've organized my course by topic, I'm still using segments that are consistently the same amount of time. And that's, that's been very helpful. You could also do the module by project approach. I do this in our upper level content marketing course. We have an experiential learning course, students, really operate as content marketers for outside businesses. We first start with long form written content, and then we recycle that content into videos and then infographics. So the course is really split up by that type of deliverable, works very well there. You could organize your term based on outcomes. So module by outcome. This is challenging though. This would assume that the lower level outcome is dealt with the first week or first couple of weeks of the course, and then you move on to the next outcome, which should be a little further up Bloom's taxonomy, that can work. But I've actually found that I might be looking at a course learning outcome that's pretty lofty, that is maybe higher level Bloom's in week two or three, because we're starting a project that will last the whole semester and contributes to that overall outcome. Uh, so something to, to think about there. Find out which approach works for you on the handout. I have my contact information. Would love to hear how you split up your courses. Just a couple of pro tips that I have for anybody who focuses on digital marketing and digital marketing analytics, these areas. Give yourself a little wiggle room. So build in a module that you title something like new and emerging tactics. Things are always changing in our space. 
And I wanna make sure that I built time into the class where I could address these changes. So if there was an update to uh, Instagram, you know, one semester um, GA4 rolled out, Google Analytics 4 rolled out and Clubhouse debuted in fall of 2020. Both of those things happened. They weren't on my radar at the start of the semester, built in some time to be able to accomplish that. In an initial digital marketing course, I will do two modules on digital marketing strategy at the end of the course that enables me to include any updates that happen in real time. In April, before class, about an hour before my class started over morning coffee, saw an update from Instagram that the algorithm had changed and different uh, types of approaches were going to influence ranking on that channel. It spoke to what we were talking about in class that week. I was able to pivot what I was going to do in class, still focused on meeting the course learning outcome, but had the opportunity to introduce something I hadn't planned on. All right, so once we have our CLOs and we have our modules, we can start working on the course map. This will be your best friend. This is a document you will put under your pillow. This is a document that you will send to colleagues in your department across campus or within your school, and they'll be very impressed. It's very helpful too, if you are in a position where you're establishing how a course is taught, it's great to share that with other faculty who might be teaching that course for you. For example, there's a course I typically teach in the fall, have for the past three years. I'm not going to be teaching it this fall. Somebody else will can share that resource with them if it's helpful to them. Still meeting the same course learning outcomes, they can input their own learning activities. So it's a really great versatile document. Split up into four different areas. We're gonna cover them all. And, and, and you'll see that we're not doing anything too extensive or strenuous. We're just organizing information in a way that makes it more efficient for you to roll out your course. So we need to consider what our course learning outcomes are, and we already have them. Once we've broken our course into modules though, we wanna see how each week or every two weeks, however, length, however long your module is, how it chips away at a course learning outcome. So we assign outcomes to that specific span of time. Backward course design, we're not thinking literally. So I'm gonna skip over that purple box and go straight to this red one at the end, assignments, quizzes, and exams. A lot of times we spend or focus our energy on thinking about projects and assignments first. Maybe we're not connecting them back to those CLOs or MLOs. And then lastly, in our thinking, we're going to work on learning activities how we prepare students to be assessed. It's a little bit more information here at the CLOs. I share this with my students. At the end of the class, you'll be able to do these things to help them understand that there's a purpose to what they're learning today on Friday, June 17th, that it's linked to their career goals, that it's going to help them level up and stand out in the job market. I make it very clear what the modular learning outcomes are as well. So after this week, you'll be able to do these things. I love active learning. I love when a student comes to class today and they learn something they could start employing at their internship tomorrow or next week. So really like to keep the course grounded for them. Preparation, again, learning activities, discussions, readings, how will they be ready? How can we equip them to be able to demonstrate that they've met the course learning outcomes? Remember. Outcomes are all about dem demonstration. They do need to be demonstrative. And it's important then to create assessments that speak to your course learning outcomes. Here's a snapshot of what the third week of my intro digital marketing course looks like when we begin to focus on data analysis, Google Analytics. That week of the course is designed to chip away at two CLOs, so identifying components of a firm's digital marketing ecosystem, and then analyzing and applying data, we're chipping away at those course learning outcomes with MLOs that, that really start out lower order thinking, distinguishing, identifying, recalling, all the way up into more specific and heavier lifting right? It's more specific tasks that require a little bit more thought. Everything we're going to do to prepare the students, and then how are we going to prove that they're able to meet these outcomes? So 
a lot of times, especially if you first start doing, um, oh, and thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Kim. Um, if you first start doing backward course design, you have the answers, just reorganizing what they look like. Now here, right now we're on Blackboard at Baldwin Wallace. We're transitioning over to uh, Canvas. So please let's connect. If you've gone through that tr transition, love to, to pick your brain. But here is the left-hand navigation of Blackboard course. Um, I have in the lower left here, the weekly folders. I have a folder for every module. And here is the folder for the analytics. Um, oh, Kelly, that's so good to know. Going from BB to Canvas was beneficial to you. Let's definitely connect. Um, all right, so analytics essentials. I use the learning module builder in Blackboard. And if you're on Canvas, you would create a module and add a page. So begin each week with an about this module content area, have a little bit of welcome information. And I do enable stats tracking to see who's looking at this information. And I do copy and paste in the module map for that week. I don't give the students the entire course map. I break it up to them in chunks. So again, they're focused on what they're doing today. All right, now we have our CLOs, we have our modules. How do we tackle those modular level outcomes? Well, we are going to start here with a digital marketing analytics course. And randomly, I'm going to share a plan for week 12. So in week 12 of this class, I see that I have an opportunity to chip away or work toward this CLO, right? This is pretty lofty when you think about it. Analyze digital marketing analytics across PEO. That's pretty broad. So what are some things that I can do this week? Where are we at in the course? What do they know already? What prereqs have, have they had? So I think it's really important to start out with those lower order thinking on lower order blooms, uh, distinguishing vanity metrics from a KPI, huge as students shift from being a digital consumer to a digital producer. I think it's also important once they're able to understand and identify KPIs to understand how they relate to each other, right? So a lower bounce rate on a site and a higher time on site and increased page depth all relate to each other. And maybe if we're seeing those three things on a site that just launched a new blog as part of a content marketing effort, it's a good thing. And a student should be able to articulate that by the end of this week if they were to see those data. Working up uh, to Bloom's heart, you know, heavier lifting. So I want them to be able to create a dashboard and then from that dashboard, be able to engage in some heavy duty evaluation, seeing data that it actually work, right? So we understand what KPIs are, we know how they work together, but are things working out for this business? Yes or no? Right, so that's, that's what we're going to do. We're gonna walk them through this process. Uh, just another quick look at one, looking toward that CLO ultimate outcome for the course, producing that analytics report. Gonna start off basic with some housekeeping tasks. So I want them to be able to develop a proposal. It's okay to list a specific application, particularly if they probably will be using it in industry. analytics, we want to keep track of that over time. So maybe I have a rolling assignment where every week they're responsible for looking at a data set. And then what they do with that data, how do they act on it? Okay. All right, so CLOs, MLOs, skipping over to our assessments. This is where BCD is so helpful because it helps us avoid what I call a mismatch. Right, and that has to do with a mismatch between outcomes and assessments. I see this a lot, and a lot of people don't think about it or make the connection until they look at their class this way. So maybe you have a modular learning outcome that begins with the word describe. Students should be able to describe key performance indicators. But the assessment that's used is a multiple choice quiz or exam. Think about it. What's wrong with that? Does, does a multiple choice quiz let you describe anything? No, you can identify. You could even distinguish. There's a multiple choice question, paid media is blank and owned media is blank and they have to choose A, B, C, or D. But 
A multiple choice assessment doesn't let you describe. A short essay, a short paper, a quick report, Flipgrid video, those things let you describe. It's really important to, to make sure that there's a connection. That if you have an outcome, that it's properly assessed. If you have an assessment, that it's truly meeting an outcome. Quickly, two types of assessments. We have our formative assessments and we have our summative assessments. We can have an entire workshop just on creating appropriate assessments. Formative assessments, lower order thinking skills. They're really to help the students engage in initial learning on a concept. They're easier for the students to do and should be easier for you to grade. I'm part of a movement to end discussion boards. I think discussion boards can be really challenging, right? Because they require a lot of the students, they require a lot of your time, and often you're using them just to make sure students uh, you know, completed a reading. I would spend more time and encourage students to spend more time on projects that offer them more value. So, okay, Malcolm, if you're in it with me to end the <laughs> Uh, discussion board, reliance on discussion board, let's, let's, let's go for it. Um, you know, put your time and they should put their time toward projects that really tackle those major outcomes. So higher order, demonstrative, takes more time for them to do and more time for you to grade, but you're saving time on other assessments, shorter assessments throughout the course. All right, you may have some uh, assignments throughout the term that are rolling or iterative, like a simulation, where every week at a certain point, there's a different round. That's okay. It's still contributing to a course learning outcome. And you might even be able to time your class and the simulation so that a, a specific round is really tailored to what you're talking about that week. Maybe you have a major project, an intro to digital marketing class. They conceive a website starting from week one all the way to week 16, lots of deliverables in between. That's OK, too. Uh, again, the backward course design, though, might help you make connections between the bigger project and what you're doing each week. So you don't have to necessarily paint yourself into a corner and only be focused that week on the topic, the MLO at hand. This is about a larger, meeting larger outcomes for your students. So just looking now at some MLOs and assessments that, that I would recommend, if, if we have a lower level MLO around distinguishing those vanity metrics from KPIs, a, a chapter quiz, that's going to do it. That's going to help them understand some vocabulary. It's going to assess that they can recall some specific pieces of information and differentiate them. Looking at a different MLO where we want them to be able to interpret something, we're moving up. That's that's heavier lifting here. So I need to give them an assignment where they can demonstrate interpreting data, comparing data, relating data, and also create a narrative around those things. So I'll use the demo account for Google Analytics certification for the merch store and give them some data to find, give them some discussion questions to answer in short essay form. Moving our way up, heavier lifting want them to visualize raw data. So this is an intro to data visualization. And then once they visualize data, make sense of it, assess it. So maybe I have a group project um, that requires them to do an analysis of a major brand. They have to prepare a report and present their findings too. So again, when you select assessment, it's really all about making sure that we're meeting whatever the MLO you described for that week. Now, how do we equip our students to be able to be assessed? It's in the preparation. Again, preparation should speak to the assessment, which speaks to the MLO. We're keeping the levels of effort consistent. Quizzes for chapters six through eight, maybe it's lecture notes and those chapters. If the assessment is that Google Merchandise Store case study project, maybe I give them a case study to read that's similar to what they will be doing. Maybe we have a class discussion on the importance of focusing on some data over others. And something I want to do this year, since we've gone from universal analytics to GA4, is to have a treasure hunt. Here's a metric in UA. Work with the group to find how you get that same or similar data in G4. So fun classroom sessions, preparing them to be assessed. Okay. All right, so now some time for questions. Just want to do a quick recap here. As you start to employ backward course design, 
make sure you have that list of CLOs. Take an approach that speaks to the topic at hand, the chapters, the book you're using, other activities, and the schedule to come up with your course modules. Put them together to get your course map. This, again, will help guide all of your classes. It keeps you on track. It helps the students connect what they're doing in class today to the career they'll have a few years from now. Does really create a nice everybody wins scenario. Okay. All right, so I will drop this link into the chat, but you can grab my course map template, my contact information, and some other resources. And happy to open it up to Q and A. Uh, we have a few more minutes if anyone wants to drop a question into the chat. Oh, good. I'm glad that you like the the idea of the GA four treasure hunt. That is that is a, a an assignment that will help students if they're interning at an organization that is also making that transition from UA over to GA4 um, because they'll potentially be in a role to really assist with that transition. A lot of employers haven't made that switch either. It'll definitely make your students stand out. So this year had a question about carrying the weight in group projects. You know, it, it, group projects are, are offer so much value to students in terms of learning to communicate and to collaborate. But I understand the concern if we're looking about um, creating scenarios where students individually can demonstrate mastery of a concept or of a course, course learning outcome. So I do include a performance review um, as part of any group project that I offer that, that does weigh in on the grade, as well as some other assignments that encourage students to, to really split the work in a fair way. Yeah, yep, again, challenges of group projects. I actually use them less than I, than I used to. Oh, thanks, Joe, appreciate that. Oh, Kim, so um, I'll connect you to some resources. There's the Flipped Learning Institute. We offer a lot of great programs, Flipped Learning. But you know, in terms of digital marketing analytics, you, you could have students um, review uh, some initial content, maybe from Google Analytics Academy, and then in class one day, have everybody logged into the demo account for um, Google Analytics, and you, you give them certain um, pieces of data you want to find. Or maybe you ask a question, what was the top selling product last week? How did that compare to the top selling product from two years ago? So you're giving them the prep ahead of time so that your class is an entirely like active session. Flipped classroom, a lot of the projects that would typically be assigned as homework, the students do in class and things they would do in class like a quiz or exam they do at home. How do I approach lecture? Um, in a class that meets three times a week, Monday, if I'm introducing a new topic or module, I will be a little bit lecture focused there, Elizabeth. I always do, I just create a, a Google form and it's a bit.ly slash the course number and then QOTD, question of the day. So even if I'm doing lecture, I like to make it active somehow. And then on Wednesday, we might apply what we learned or talked about on Monday and then Friday would be flipped. Um, depending on the, the course, if it's upper level, like my content marketing course, I really don't do much lecture. It's pretty much entirely flipped and they're watching videos from me or another provider um, in prep for what they need to do in class that day. Um, the example I gave about Instagram changing its, its ranking algorithm while I was having my morning coffee um, spoke to the learning outcomes that day. I brought in that video, I, I displayed it on screen and then had a quick group activity. So I didn't even really, I had planned more of a lecture but brought in that video and, and converted the preparation for that week to a little bit more hands-on. Yeah, Kim, I'll include that in, that's a good, that's a good point. I'll include uh, information about that team on my document. I'll update, I'll update that. But if you work with um, HubSpot, uh, you can create a team 
um, where you invite students and give them access to certain tools.